ask everyone to join now. People will join. Hi, Kapil. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hey, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Let me just do this. Hi. Hey. Not sure you can see me because I can't see myself. But okay. we can see you. All right. Uh, okay. So we'll wait for some time. Meanwhile, if you want to check your presentation, etc., or share and check it, then we can do that. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think I just have to share screen, right? Yeah, you have to just share screen. This is normal Zoom, so should be fine. You can do that. Share screen. Yes. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah? Yeah, it's great. You can stop soon. Great. Are we um, are we starting or how we do? No, we'll we'll wait for. Um, okay. it's, it's still four five minutes left. Yeah, sure, sure. Let me just uh, stop sharing and then we can do this again. Yeah. If you want to grab a cup of tea, you can before we start. <laughs> Are you telling me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm good, you I'm would good. be the one who have to perform today. We are going to have our, yeah. uh, have our cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm, I'm just back from the factory right now. Uh, had That's a very good space stay. to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My favorite place. <laughs> Today we are getting a diverse group of students, it seems. Okay. So, architecture and interior design, I guess. No idea, but the name seems different, so I'm just saying that <laughs> okay. not everyone seems to be the known. Uh -huh.
Karan, can you check with the Arun's batch? Where are they? Yeah. I'm sure it is 14th. It doesn't mean it's just a date. Yes, sometimes they are just joining me in a minute. You have shared with them the link, no? Yes. We have a, we are nearing 50. So once we cross 50, we'll start. Okay, let them join. So meanwhile, uh, Sankal, yeah. I just wanted to ask you, since since the time I have known uh, Seth, it's been a long time. I used to do internship at uh, Mr. Leo Pereira's office oh, in wonderful. 2009. So since then, Seth has changed a lot. And I've, uh, I've heard that you have a lot of courses uh, going on over there, apart from you know uh, urban architecture and uh, interior and architecture in general so and planning i think so i think these are the older ones but there are the newer ones that are there so can you just uh, tell me what how what kind of people are there in this group so that i can uh, structure things accordingly? see what has happened what has happened in course of time is that the faculty of interior design has become faculty of design and so a lot of uh, you know work related to uh, let's say product design, furniture design, all, all has entered set through the earlier faculty of interior design, which, were, which is now called the faculty of design. So that is one shift in last eight years, slowly. That's, mm -hmm. that's the shift which is happening, which is the new kind of crowd that you'll get it, uh, which otherwise we didn't have. And of course we have okay. faculty of management now, which of course may, they may, they may not be interested but the rest of the, uh, um, at least from the point of view, courses remain same. Okay, they have not changed. The only thing that has changed over a period of time has been the number of students. Okay. And the number of students have increased because of, um, uh, so number of students in, has increased for a number of reasons. One of the reasons, of okay. course, is that we have moved from the, from the grant in aid to an independent private university. Uh, so from the government's grant, and I don't think all the departments were getting grant, but School of Architecture was getting grant from, from the government. 
we have moved out, but uh, we have increased the seat because once you are in a state, there is a certain amount of seat in which you have to keep it for the state students. So what what has happened is that that forty intake remains, and another forty has been added for all India. So what it means okay. is that you will see much more diversity of students than perhaps last twenty five years, where slowly and steadily the numbers of outside students reduced. Ah, uh -huh. right. So that is the mm -hmm. shift. So in the master's program, you'll see students all across the country. Certainly, mm -hmm. master's program for a long time there was a program where after those constraints in the UG program, master students are generally across the country. Uh -huh. So awesome, wonderful. So that's a good context to start off with. Um, if you guys are ready, we can start off. With uh, yeah, we have already phase. crossed 55. So by the time in few minutes, it will cross 70, 75 generally. Okay. So we wait for a bit. No, I think that maybe at least uh, somebody can, Kosha, who is introducing, at least somebody can start introducing can him and then we will we'll move ahead. Let other people join. Yeah, so I'll that's start. all right. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Shivani Durkunde. The series invites speakers who are engaged with particular aspects of architectural design and production in, the in their practice to throw light on topics that are central to the architectural profession, but less discussed or theorized with academia. This year, the thematic focus for the series is architectural detailing in the realm of theory and practice. Copal is a founding member and head of product design at Honor Structures. He is an alumni from the National Des Institute of Design and has been a design professional for around 10 years in the field of architecture, product design, manufacturing, and strategic innovation. He loves creating contextual and intelligent everyday objects through experiments with materials. His works were displayed at Alliance Friends de Delhi, India, as a part of 20 under 35 emerging designers exhibit, a curation of designers, and works across different facets of design. Sir, we are glad to have you at this TED Talk series. Over to you now. Hi, um, thanks, Shivani, and thank you for, for this opportunity to talk in this particular forum. Um, it's wonderful to be back at SEPT in some form or the other after we did a small stint at the SEPT library. So you see a couple of products of ours actually at the SEPT library hanging around in different spaces. There are, I think, stools and benches. And uh, hopefully we'll be there in other places in Ahmedabad, so you can check out very soon. Um, let me start off this thing. Okay, can you see? Hello? No, no, no it is. Not there. Okay, just just hang on. Okay. Can you see now? Yes. Wonderful. So, so when I actually heard this topic uh, detailing, and I was putting it in, our, in you know our context of what we do currently right now, it uh, it it's very baffling because we don't uh, currently in in the products that we do right now, we don't detail parts of the product or anything like that. They emerge out of the engineering that we are doing um, in the products. We have an intent to do certain things. We keep on. Uh, you know, developing a particular particular piece, and the detailing happens sub, you know, in a, in a subconscious way throughout whatever knowledge that we have gained regarding the materials that we deal with. So I thought that it's better to give you a context of uh, what we do, because if we directly dwell into detailing, that may not make sense uh, right now. So I, I want to take you to 
I, I, I thought that management students would also be there, so there would be a discussion, but regardless, I think this is a very important part of uh, the product journey is how, okay. right, this is just to remind. And I would like to tell you what we do at Honest Structures actually. Um, just, just hold on, I, I can see the screen intersecting with all the participants, so I need to figure this one out, otherwise I can't. Uh, okay, guys, uh, my computer has gone extremely slow right now. So I need to figure this thing out a bit. Can you just hold on for like two minutes? Yeah, yeah, please do that. Not okay. Please do that. I can hardly see anyone from from the last batch. 
Ayushi is there. I can only see Ayushi. Rest of them are enjoying their lives. Hi. Yeah. Sorry about this. You can't uh, live without this, and you can't live with it also. <laughs> this tech thing. Uh, I'm just going to start this back. All right, now I can see. <laughs> Wonderful. So at HS, um, you know, our big idea is we don't want to make a lot of things. We want to make as less as possible, but as good as possible. We want to do the business in that particular direction only. So, uh, so whatever we would make we would, would be absolutely the best quality that can last for a long, long time rather than something that lasts for a short duration of a time. Then um, just cross check. I, you guys can hear me, right? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, hear. all right, all right. So uh, second thing is all the production that we are trying to do is uh, local, and it is also tailored to local needs. So we are doing collections of products that can be modified for local uh, needs wherever possible. And we are currently present in the US, we are present in India, and uh, we'll be present in Japan very soon. So everything that we're doing is of the same quality and everything, but uh, tailored to the local uh, needs. We are also using certain kind of raw materials that are present globally in the same grade and same, same manner, and also the manufacturing processes that are available across the globe so that there is a consistency in the products that we do and the cons consistency in whatever we are delivering to all the users across, right? So yeah, maintaining the same quality regardless of the maker or the location. We also are coming up with an idea where we don't want to have overheads at all. So no warehousing, no, no stocking. You know, but uh, still deliver the same kind of quality in design and engineering across the globe. So these are the kind of ethos that we start with uh, when we talk about honest structure and honest structure products that we do. And uh, to tell you that, like like I said, the products are actually designed with certain kind of ethos. So uh, all the detailing and all the uh, you know all the entire intent is built into the product. And now what the products are a combination of intent and raw material and the manufacturing that we can find easily across the globe. So with this thing, um, this is the background of what we do in terms of uh, products. And what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to build ecosystems where we can do different spaces regardless, you know, kind of agnostic to whether they're offices, cafes or homes or this and that kind of things so that we are able to cater to large um, uh, large number of people and large number of spaces. Uh, so this, this is the kind of stuff that we currently make. We make tables, we make storage solutions, which are on the floor across the walls, um, uh, dividers, units uh, to sit and sleep on kind of things. But we are very generic in terms of uh, the kind of design they are. So they can be modified for local needs. So, so far can be different for say someone in Bombay would be different for someone in Assam. 
depending on their needs so we would have a discussion with them and we the things are designed in a platformic manner so they can be modified uh, easily uh, i just wanted to tell you a background of the raw material that we use uh, and the processes that we use uh, currently so the raw materials are in sheet format for us all so they come in a sheet size depends on you know where it's located but mostly it comes in a 1200 1250 mm by 25 mm um, sheet size and the thicknesses range from 2 mm to 2.5 to 3 this is what we currently use so this is how the first process is whether sheet is loaded it is laser cut uh, in a particular manner uh, however we want to now our task is always to minimize the waste down to 2% so we want to use maximum sheet as much as possible without wastage which is the primary idea of being uh, sustainable and sensible so an output of a laser cutting machine would look something like this it comes in sheets so they are laser cut and they are stacked um then a uh, machines which is this is a press break machine which is calibrated uh for the particular job that needs to be done and then the job is loaded sometimes by two people sometimes by a single person depending on the size of the job and then the bending is done on uh, on the machines an output of a bent bent product or a finished product not a finished but a bent product would look something like this this is then taken and it, there is seven tank process that is done uh, to clean each part um so that clean each part surface basically not the internals of the sheet metal but the surface is generally clean with the seven tank process so that a coating can be applied to it this is the first coat that is applied uh, which is a primer coat um so it is not the final coat it's just a coat which is the protective coat now like i said earlier as our mandate we have that the products need to last long so that's why we do a two two coating process so that you know the longevity of the part is extended beyond its regular uh, you know powder coating standards this is then you know uh, once the primer is done it is baked into a machine this entire thing is loaded in this square grill thing uh, all the parts are loaded and then they are put into baking at like uh, 300 degrees celsius depends on the um, on the powders that used but 300 to 700 is what uh is used then this is the first layer so a primer would be about 180 microns or in terms of mm it is 0.18 mm but all of this would come into consideration in detailing so i'm just explaining how this goes then the first uh, layer of coating is applied in this case the coating was white so a white color is applied a dft check is done uh dft is basically the dry film thickness which is on the surface and that too is across approximately 200 microns so now you see if your sheet is uh, sheet size that you started with is was 2 mm when the primer was done it was 2.36 when the paint is done now now we are talking about 2.76 uh, kind of uh, uh, material thickness that we are dealing with now and then yeah the coating is done it is stacked on a particular pallet of a size and then it's packed another thing i wanted to share was something called supply chain which is again another thing that affects uh, affects the detailing of the product massively because supply chain is an intent or an idea that you want to establish to uh, get your products to the people so i'm i'm just telling you an example of a previous uh, previous product that we had designed that i had designed not a part of honest structures but this will give you an idea of um, of what supply chain is, is and how it is also important to detailing so yeah this is the product i'm just going to play this video
So um, anybody can tell me how many components were there in this this particular product. So this uh, just to give you a background, it's a product. It's a it's a modular system that can be configured and reconfigured in different ways depending on how the user wants it in in their lifetime. So that's a general idea. But anyone who can tell me how many components were there? If not, um, I I can. So it involved uh, twenty one components basically in total. Uh, 21 types of components in in different multiplication but basically there were only 21 in fact there were less than 21 in this particular case so this product collection is about these 21 parts there are something called uprights there are something called shelves drawers different size shelves and back panels and you know strainers and a particular hardware so the reason is uh, we'll come to the reason this why it was designed in a particular manner the entire idea was uh, at the back end, uh, the company wanted to manufacture as less products as possible. So if you manufacture, if you have only 21 types of uh, components that can do different solutions in terms of storage, that's the ideal, ideal way, 21 or less or whatever. So this is how the supply chain worked in this particular case. Um, there was a warehousing, uh, there was a manufacturing where certain parts are made, certain parts are coated and certain parts are uncoated and kept. Uh, then a customer would, um, you know, on an app design his own storage shel shelving solution. This would be component component based list chart that would be provided to different entities within the company. And one would be the warehousing. Now the warehousing would know that the list of parts that are to be fulfilled for a particular order, they would decide if they need to paint anything uh, uh, that we painted. And uh, then the entire order would be packed in a particular thing and it would be shipped to the user. And there would be the, the assembly people over there who would have got the assembly guidelines through the same app. And then they would assemble the, the product at the site. Now, as a designer, you are far removed from the actual assembly that is happening at the site, actual people who are going to use it or assemble it or manufacture it. What you are connected with is probably prototyping and that's it, right? So if you make an error in terms of any sheet size or any anything in joinery, whatever, that error, you can see that it's getting multiplied across at so many different uh, junctures within the delivery to the people, right? So if you, this is what we learn from a particular supply chain, if you want to achieve this. Um, this, put, huh. this particular idea requires less component. It requires minimum hardware as possible. It requires easy assembly, extreme clarity in assembly. It requires easy manufacturing. It requires designing for storage. And it requires, you know, certain kind of color options that you can only give. You can't give everything kind of a thing. If you see every component, there is no uh, left hand component or right hand component to do a particular uh, assembly, a particular you know design. Every component. Hello, is, this is math class. Math class. Uh, Hello. Yeah, carry Hello. on, carry on. I think somebody needs to mute Vivek. Yeah, Kopal, you carry on. Right. Um, so this is a system with which you can do zillion storage solutions in so many colors possible and all those kind of things, right? So at the back end, uh, when it comes to detailing of it, you will you will have to keep in mind the manufacturing, you'll have to keep in mind the supply chain, you'll have to keep in mind the people who are assembling uh, at people's place. They, and all of this is apart from how people will use it. Now, customer study and everything is definitely required. But beyond that, you have to make sure that the entire process and everything is absolutely as smooth as possible. So detailing is done with the whole intent of that. Now, just an, as an example, this is a shelf. Uh, at now, I don't, I, I don't want to get into the detail of this, but 
this shelf doesn't have a left side or a right side or a front or a back the reason being at site at an assembly site you would not be able to tell the guy assembling that oh assemble it with this at the front or this at the side or this panel is is the same across the front back top bottom he can assemble it the way, way he wants to and it will still be correct that is that that kind of detailing is built into the product so that all the kinds of errors that you can possibly imagine doesn't really happen uh, you know when assembly or when using okay so coming to honest structures and what the kind of products that we do so i wanted to take an example of say three products or four products that we do and explore them and tell you how we did certain designing or certain detailing of uh, those products and to start off with this is the first one so this is a wall system okay um it's a storage solution that people can design with us uh, without us um and they can uh you know install it at their site with their carpenters or with our installation team so all of this thing that you saw earlier supply chain the honest structures intent everything is built into the product right now so to start off with it's a single panel uh, wall panel that is on the wall and uh, that has certain components that we have designed that can go on the on the panel it can be out of wood it can be out of metal or it can be out of something called compact laminate if you guys are aware and you the same thing can go expanding so the same panel was repeated thrice to make this system it was repeated four times and horizontally and vertically to make this system it's repeated more than that for you know building something like this you can build something like a workstation solution with an extended desk you can do a closet open closet kind of a thing or you can just go on building your wall as long and as wide as you want and every component is designed to fit a cross and tab thing yeah so it was never uh, those okay so idea started there but uh, to get to that point uh, let me share you how it uh, how what kind of problems what kind of problems we uh, encountered um and then what kind of solutions we came up with so this is our first prototype i'm just sharing from uh, the first prototype point of view so we we did this we installed it uh, at at another at a location um and then realized a lot of things that uh, were intended but were not matching so we were when we installed this we were like oh this is too heavy uh, it can't be installed by some single person so it the size needs to be reduced by the reduction in size the reduction weight would come um and then that that is one 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 thing then we were like okay then the multi, so the slots were designed to take in the detail i'll share this detail later but the slots are designed to take in the details so every component is influenced by each other when you put them together um we wanted to we the first problem that we encountered here was oh uh, we had done a bend okay sheet metal always has bending in it uh, reason being sheet metal bending gives the strength to the uh, component right so there is a bend in the front of this particular shelf um, this is to load as many books as possible and it won't buckle down if there is no bend is nothing if you load this thing uh, it will behave like paper it will bend in this particular manner on the front side and at the back if there is no bend at the back so we had to make sure how do we strengthen this uh, minus we didn't like the fact that oh it's looking bulky on the front uh, we wanted to make sure that the system is not important as the products that are kept products need to be highlighted or if we if this is going to retail or even home for that matter whatever people are keeping on the shelf matters more than the shelf themselves so that was more important to us so so then we were like um how do you strengthen the shelf without the bend on the front so we came up with another way where we cut a part in the shelf and start bending it downwards um on on both sides so and and a bend upwards so all of these things 
our details by engineering and 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 get a free uh, edge in the front so these are the kind of things that we encounter and that, that's how the detailing happens in in our products okay so another encountered problem was we we wanted to do seamless uh, wall system right so the slots one we had done the first design was 2.75 cut as i told you earlier that you know when you do this double coating in everything the cut itself uh, the the thickness of the metal goes down to goes up to 2.76 so a 2.75 cut would mean that the part doesn't go at all actually in the uh, that this part would not in, go inside this part at all the cut had to be incre in, increased to 3 mm now the second problem was how do you assemble a component across two panels that means that the distance between two slots currently 20 mm and uh three slots is 40 mm so the distance between this guy and this guy had to be the same as this guy and this guy right so the detailing of this end corner completely was based on how do you achieve that and uh, that also that also is um, the complexity is added by the powder coating again because uh you see there is there are two elements coming together so there would be an unnecessary uh, gap that has to be created in the sheet metal which is about uh which is about point uh, which is about 1.2 so that was created and then uh this the uh, you know the slots were increased uh so all of these small small things happened during the course of uh, designing this particular product collection okay so visually we thought that uh, you know if the shelf comes directly down it gives uh, gives less confidence in the stability uh, to the person viewing it so it needs to come flat out and then downwards so this is another detail that was explored on the prototype okay then arriving at how the how the two components lock with each other was a critical point a uh, critical engineering point because there were so many surfaces coming in touch with each other and then the powder coating was to be kept in mind powder coating primer coating everything was kept in to be kept in mind another thing that is to be kept in mind always is uh, the error with the machines that was all that's also always accounted with every con every contact between two elements that we have in the products so all of this was kept in mind hundreds of iterations were done to arrive at the exact exact detail for the corner and how the assembly would happen this is the bending that i was talking about that you 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 offset the bending and to do another bend a couple of bends in the entire product, uh, entire shelf to make it stronger but you know you have a free edge in the front so when someone keeps anything you don't see the shelf you see the products only this is an interesting component in this collection i i i think uh, so it has two two parts where it locks into the wall uh, but it has two flanges going in opposite direction the entire intent is if you imagine it only being at one position it would swing like that um and it would bend in either direction but the bending was crossed as in it was taken care of by you know two bends on either sides and uh, the swaying was taken care of by another slot so now if you put this you can load anything on this like your heavy bags or whatever so all of these small small things are the details that emerge out of uh, necessity also but <laughs> they are an opportunity to explore the material uh, for me yeah the same details uh, there across all the shelves and everything so when someone is assembling at site lot of times we don't even get calls from uh, our uh, you know our clients because they say that the carpenter figured out themselves um, and that is what we actually want that without us telling someone is able to figure out how this is done how it's loaded on the wall how every shelf is done everything just by themselves that's the detailing that you built into the product this is interesting so again so imagine across the world we are trying to do this and uh, this is a, a box unit kind of a thing or a closed shutter unit that we wanted to do 
So imagine you're doing this across the world and you're basing a particular thing on a particular hardware, like the shutter or something like that, or a rail, and you're, you don't get it in particular location, then you are, uh, you are in a, you know, pickle. So we wanted to make sure that our, our uh, box unit or sliding unit that is on the wall doesn't have any hardware at all. It is purely based on the design um, of the sheet metal components and the way they are dealt with. So this is a video of that. There is no hardware. There is, um, it's all based on how the sheet metal components are bent. And this piece is actually uh, fly right now for the prototype, but it, it's, a, it's a compact laminate uh, sheet. So the sheet is absolutely smooth and everything. So uh, all these details can be incorporated very easily. This is how the, you know, the shutter looks from the bottom and uh, the top detail is similar but uh, a little different and we we do a process called um, routing on the side of this particular piece again this is an example of the same thing that you know you have so many uh, pieces coming together so you have to be absolutely sure on and you have to be mindful of the different uh, thicknesses and coatings and everything that you're doing because an MM shift in anything would make would make, make uh, sure that the products don't assemble at all or line do, don't line up with the wall or don't line up with each other. It, it creates a massive mess and we have learned it through, uh, you know, we have done this and learned it. So all of these errors were were a part of the journey to get here. This is one of the installations that I did at our place only. Okay, so again, like I told you earlier, our intent was that uh, the system helps you organize your stuff, but your stuff is more important than the uh, furniture. So when it is actually loaded, you don't really see the furniture, you see your stuff, basically, which was very important to us. Yeah, same example, it's the same picture, but with, with uh, products. So generally we give this to all our clients uh, on how to install the wall system at their own place with, you know, with, with local carpenters and all. So this is a part of detailing in terms of, uh, you know, customer experience that we do. So this is another thing that I wanted to share. Okay, I'll tumble this little backwards. So the way the system is actually assembled is uh, there is a marker to mark the whole positions on the wall. Um, and this uh, loading strip is loaded. Then each panel is loaded on the first le level and consecutively you start climbing upwards. So yeah, 
once that is done you start loading components technically there is no way single procedure that you have to start on the top or bottom you can start anywhere as per your liking but we use special hardware uh, for the wall system so um, so that you know the strength of the wall absolute wall is utilized there is uh, yeah and that those you know the wall strips don't come out of uh, the wall all right so the next uh, product is actually something that we uh, did during covid uh, first wave of covid uh, we had gone to gmc over here in goa to ask the director if he needs anything because our factory was operational as they are you know into healthcare uh, uh, into healthcare products products otherwise also so he was like there is a need for beds but we they can't predict right now um so we like we took that as a challenge the only thing was the beds had to be ridiculously strong they can should be able to be thrown around um a lot and they had to be in a price bracket of 7000 bucks so it was a challenge that we were like okay let's uh, try this so this is the design that we had come up with the wastage of in this sheet metal cutting was down to 1% a um, single sheet of 2 by 4 was cut into multiple parts to do the rest of it and there were there were two hardware that would go into it and uh, then you you so yeah okay so every structure like i told you earlier the the bend, the strength of the metal actually comes from the bending so we introduced uh, multiple bends in a in a you know in a in a particular sheet and it was done in a reverse triangle format so that it's as strong as possible the load transfer is perfect and uh, the same components were built uh, you know bent out towards and inwards to make sure that the contact area of the bed was as much as possible um and uh, there were these bends which was stiffeners across the entire uh, you know sides so all, every side had three stiffeners on both sides and this is how the bed would be deployed so this was our first prototype was a little sketchy but uh, but what we eventually achieved was uh, much stronger than this and much easier assembly wise also so so it only came down to locking once it was locked it was as strong as to stand on do anything on it and then once the fastener would go through it would not uh, move at all and you can just pick up the bed from that point all right so yeah that was a fun part and the detailing was absolutely fun okay so the next product uh, is a very simple thing it's a round table basically um, you know with the uh, a frame kind of legs uh, it's a part of another uh, it's a part of this entire collection that we had done so this this picture is from uh, charles courier's office in goa so we have a product collection which is called a frame collection from where the stools and benches are there in your library uh, this collection is designed with a reason that you should be able to do any kind of surfaces as long as wide as possible with this system and uh, manufacturing wise we have five sku's in this uh, sku means five parts that can be repeated across to you know do any kind of tables any kind of benches tools anything like that so this is the general look of all of these guys right so let, let me just uh, show you this actually um 
with you guys. I'm just going to turn the sharing thing off and share a product with you here. Okay, can you guys see me? Just give yes. me a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so, I just want to show you this. Okay. All right. So, this is the stool uh, which is there at your place also, but let me just uninstall this and show it to you. So, this is a simple stool. There's another thing that we had done is, uh, you know, there is a seat on this, which is a leather seat, but it is basically metal underneath. And uh, the way we have uh, put the seat is interesting. It has magnets actually. So you can unlock from the bottom, push the seat sheets out and your seat is out, okay? So your seat is out and the way to disassemble this is very simple. It has two screws, one here and one here. And uh, you can manually unscrew them. They look something like this. And you, then you un unlock them. Or you, the way to unlock and lock is like a, is the kind of a thing that, uh, that your ID students have done themselves at the, uh, at the library. So yeah, um, that is the general language of the product, product collection that uh, I'm sharing. But this one is, the one I'm sharing is slightly different. Okay, coming back to this. So this round table thing is also based on the same system. Uh, we wanted to use the same components again to make the, make the round table as you know, as in the back end, you would have to maintain less uh, parts as possible. So can you create a round table was the idea with uh, this particular system. So this is how the round table is. There is a table, um, table top, and then the, the frames are the frames are similar kind of uh, this guy that you saw. Again, everything can be hand assembled by hand. You don't need any particular uh, tool or anything like that. You can do everything by hand. And then your table is ready. Now, the detailing of this table, like you would think that um, the trough was, or, or this cutout was introduced because we wanted to keep certain things in the cutouts and everything, which was one of the reason, but it was a, it was an engineering reason more than, uh, more than usability reason, but arriving at the exact dimension was through uh, both understanding user perspectives and understanding manufacturing perspectives. Yeah. So this is, this is a couple of images of the same. Uh, this is used in a particular cafe. This was at an exhibition. Um, this is in a home space scenario where it was used for office and, you know, eating and all those kind of things. So, in as far as use case scenarios goes, uh, all our products are designed for, uh, you know, multiple multiple use case scenarios. It could be cafes, restaurants, co-working spaces, 
not specific on you know that the product is designed for a home or something like that or for office so another interesting product from unstructured is this one i really truly love this product because of uh it's slightly different than in anything else that we do but uh, as an ethos it is the same intent is still the same this is uh basically a divider uh space divider and uh, what you see on screen is not one single you know com uh, piece it is set of uh, three components they are identical to each other but the assembly is kind of a yin and yang kind of a thing so you see that one is coming out the other one is going in the other one is coming out stuff like that but they all inter interlock with each other through a mechanism that we use and uh, and the reason for them to come out and go in and all of that is there because we want to create maximum surface contact on the ground so that the uh, that the screens don't topple right that was the intent to do all of this but this was used as an opportunity to create you know kind of a mini storage within the screens or the dividers and uh, this is at a retail space where he was you know using it to do stuff uh, keep articles on the shelves to sell and stuff this is at a home space scenario where she was using to keep books and other things and apart from that using this as a magnetic wall which is the intent but what i really truly love is uh, the way we had detailed the corners and the kind of radiuses that were used in this entire product so it creates amazing sciography across when you see them in you know spaces this is how it looks from the top so it goes like like a zigzag zigzag kind of a thing but they are all the same components actually they are not different it creates amazing modes like this when you look at individual pieces and zoom them you know into the product so yeah this is what i wanted to share with you uh let me know what your thoughts are and any questions if anyone has any question kindly raise your hands and we'll uh, unmute you all meanwhile kopal you can stop sharing so that uh, you would be able to see the participants yeah done okay meanwhile i think that uh, uh students may or participants may find uh, you know or if they have questions but uh, but let me tell you that uh, one that this is the you can also type questions in the text box okay uh so this is the first time we at least in from my point of view this is the first time we have invited a product designer uh mm. in in the architecture forum to talk on detail and there is a very clear difference okay uh, you may not realize it or you may realize it when you start seeing uh, how different it is okay and and let me uh, let me bring out some of the differences but i found it fascinating okay and uh, i also found it fascinating first because uh, when an architect starts designing a furniture and when somebody who is trained in the furniture design and product and they start thinking about the furniture you see the concern seems to be aligned to some extent but not fully because uh, because you see the way he has brought in right from his global concerns about materials okay uh, about the use of tools etc okay so that you are able to with the same quality etc you are able to to produce at different places uh, itself is a very different way of thinking okay um, because because what it sort of gives you is that 
there is a thought in a possibility of a technology that is universal okay there is a thought in the in the possibility of having materials and sizes reasonably which are universal okay very interesting way to think about it um, and when it when you start looking at that then the second thing that starts emerging is that um, this the the way to think about detailing and when when you think about think about that uh, you see the difference when a user is trying so there is a user interface or or let's say the user is trying to install on their own okay or the detail is worked out in a way that uh, that that somebody has thought in details how will a person who doesn't know too much will be able to you know install it okay and therefore not only that uh, the details are worked out both dynamically because sometimes you rotate it not all the but because sometimes you rotate to do it but also uh, in a way that at any point in time you have uh, you have i would say you have uh, to a great extent uh, made the detail structurally stable okay using the maximum strength of the of the of let's say the steel plate okay that's the second point i i sort of wanted to to sort of point, point out okay now the third point he already showed was again very very interesting is the whole assembly line okay sequencing of things how it starts with one one step to another to the third so even when he was talking about the plates he was talking about how when you do certain processes how does it change how does the thickness changes etc what are the steps for it and then how does it sort of eventually goes to a site and, and you sort of uh, assemble it okay so i i found uh, let's say these three points extremely interesting i'll come back but let uh, let jeshri or, or somebody who was trying to ask question uh, first sure what you said was absolutely true uh, i also realized it post uh, talking and now that you're saying it that the you know it's very so i i have been an architect but mostly product designer beyond that and i see a mass difference in you know how we look at uh, in fact how we look at scales also you know we we can't talk in kind of inches we can't even talk in centimeters or we have realized we can't even talk in millimeters we have to talk in microns at lot of points so uh, it's a very different uh, world compared to architecture because your scale of handling is changing and your uh, you know in 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 maybe in architecture um, 5 mm is like chalta hai but in 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 my thing 5 microns bhi nahi chalta hai <laughs> so you have to be so uh, uh, absolutely careful in the kind of coatings that you are uh, doing or some stuff like that or the thickness maybe there's the variation in 0.6 mm thickness Tolerance. or something tolerances are extremely important fitting is extremely important and when you're dealing with multiple components that means let's say you're doing the wall system an error of uh, 0.4 mm uh, across one component and you're doing something say uh, you know 10 meters or something like that that gets multiplied so many times across one particular one component then your entire assembly is 40 mm longer you know so <laughs> there are these things that we learned in our journey and the last point before jayshree you may ask question which i wanted to also say is the overall expression of the of the whole product and which was quite pleasing in fact i had uh, written a very short note about this too because uh, okay. one that apart from from its structural stability every parts are so well thought you know even if you are bending it the side gap versus when you bend it okay yeah. it has a logic of construction but it also has a logic of of ergonomics it has a logic of uh, structure and everything so beautifully and elegantly comes up uh, in fact uh, there was an exercise which Thank i had you. given in which uh, in which i think one of the students uh, again brought that stool okay mm -hmm. the stool of and and it was she would have picked up from the internet and and brought that stool and that reminded me i need to invite you all <laughs> <laughs> because awesome uh, thank you because it's so well done i mean after a long time i saw a very well designed uh, um, stool in a way 
that every time I would touch to, to find out is this extra, I could not point out what was extra. Okay. Yeah. It was so well done. Okay. So, yeah. so I mean, uh, there's no end to awesome. this, uh, but, but I really sort of felt that uh, students need to see what goes. See, the thing is when you are saying engineering is a process of arriving at expression, it is not enough, but it is important. Um, yeah. And, and, and I truly believe that uh, if the engineering is uh, done absolutely correct, everything is thought through, the, uh, then the details would look beautiful by themselves. You don't really have to uh, put an effort into aesthetics of things. So that is something that we maintain across uh, you know, all the products that we do. Even the curves or the bend lines or you know, there is a, there's a turning somewhere. All the things are because the load transfer or something of the you know, structural logic is there to it. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Someone, Jeshree, wanted to ask questions. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, so I had the exact same question about scale, and uh, is there a possibility of multiplying this uh, component? And if you have tried anything like that in the architectural space, like have you tried a wall system or something? Uh, that you can multiply and you know increase the scale and if you have tried anything like that awesome question um, it is our next step we are actually getting into modular housing from this point onwards where all of this would be explored further so we haven't really tested the architectural limit of uh, this thought process but uh, this is definitely next in line to us right now and if any one of you wants to explore it, we are happy to um, help. Sorry, I can't hear you. And just one small follow-up. Have you clubbed materials? Uh, yes. Have you? Uh, not fused materials yes. together, yes. but... Uh, but clubbing has been there in terms of certain materials. Like like I told you, compact laminate is something that we definitely use for surfaces and those kind of things. And so we actually talked to Green Lamb, right? Green Lamb is one of the suppliers you guys must be knowing. They make a lot of things. We told them that, uh, you know, they do compact lamb where they do surface in a different color. Do I have an example of it? <laughs> okay, I don't have an example of it right in front of me. Uh, but they do surface in different color, then the core is in different color, uh, like black or brown or something like that. And then the, you know, the other surface is in different color. And we are like, you know, our people, our kind of customers don't really care about, um, they, they are, there is a different surface on the top or at the bottom. They would like, would love, uh, and we would love that the entire core itself is the product. So we developed another product with them, which is just the core. There is no top, bottom but it is only the core of the product. So we eliminate the, another process of, you know, adding uh, you know, material to a particular material, which is already there. So it reduces uh, their, uh, you know, assembly time, their manufacturing time, and also brings down the process journey, journey in total for our products that we do. So there is a product that, there are tabletops that we do, which are just the core, which is either brown or black, which can be either one and they're basically compact lamps of paper. So they are extremely weatherproof because they are treated in a particular way, but extremely eco-friendly to recycle again and again. Did I answer your question on fusing or was there more? Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Abhishek, you wanted to ask some questions. Hi, Kopal. Thank you for Hi. a wonderful talk. Uh, I had two questions. I'll just quickly get to them. One was, uh, what is the impetus for designing uh, another universal system? I say another in quotes because there are, there are quite, I mean, uh, legendary very precedent. Good, very, very good question. So, uh, in fact, my role model would be Dita Rams, right? Amazing system by which, so yeah, I saw it myself a couple of times in the UK and in Europe otherwise also. 
our idea is uh, slightly different than what data rams has done it with so the components are designed in a multi multi material manner with him so the units or the drawers and everything are with the entire thing is with wood the the attaching elements to the wall are actually aluminum the hardware is um, ss so how amazing product it however amazing product it is it is a product of its time now to establish a supply chain like that say through goa would mean that i would talk to someone in calcutta to do hardware i would talk to someone in bhopal to do extrusions in aluminium sheet metal would be done somewhere here and then you know wood is coming from bombay or something like that right and then processed over here in another factory and then bought it to one particular factory and then imagine everything so you know the supply chain thing that i talked about earlier we are very hard on that the supply chain needs to be as narrow as tight as possible that's why everything that we do is in sheet metal it is processed at the same manufacturing unit it is coated with the same stuff so you reduce the number of process down to bare minimum compared to what dtram with soi does his product is amazing for 70s 80s 90s but coming in 2000s and coming today we need to make sure that the processes are as less as possible and you know uh the system is as lean and compact as possible covid has definitely exposed the the supply chain if you have read about this yeah something's coming from china something's coming from russia lockdown this that this is not coming that is not coming so you know it's massive massive inconvenience uh and massive inconvenience for businesses as well apart from users so this is an intent that we had pre covid surprisingly that our supply chain needs to be locked in in a particular place and localized yeah did i answer your question yeah yeah thank you and the second one was sort of tying into the uh, into jayesh's question that uh, when you when you combine materials like a uh, sheet metal expansion contraction takes place at the same rate uh, manageable uh, and like it's a it's a homogeneous material how but g- given your your thought and uh, your uh, choosiness towards making details how would one how would how did how do you guys approach designing for giving details across multiple materials uh okay we want so there is a certain amount of tolerance that you can build in when you are combining two different materials right so interaction point between say sheet metal and uh, wood is Uh, a certain thing we have you know left a leeway because wood holes in wood may might not come at the same accuracy as you know holes in uh, sheet metal laser cutting right so there is a leeway left for certain products when they interact with each other so that if at all there is a chance that things are not matching we make sure that it's built into the product yeah like for example can you hear me okay so just for example let's say there are four holes um where four screws are going in and you are going to hand tight them there are inserts in wood where at specific location uh that where this going this is going to come in come together right now at least one hole will be an oblong shape not a circle so that if there is a error that is taken care of in the assembly yeah awesome thank you gopal anyone else
I'm already beginning to think about uh, the detail that he made, uh, which was a hook, which was sort of uh, had a profile. And then if you look at this outside profile, which is alternate, okay? And when you insert it, that tolerance is there so that you take into consideration uh, the, the thickness of the plate. And now, um, it's quite interesting because it works with the gravity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and with, it, with the weight, and it will be very interesting to see now how do they think about a similar system in buildings because, uh, because it will require some fixity. Uh, how do you... Yeah. And you see, because this tool to me seems very interesting is because it uses only two of this and then it has a weight that you can rotate it, etc. The same thing will not happen for the building system. And I'm already right. saying that, uh, I mean, I'm already excited to, to sort of get into this thought as to as to what would that be eventually. Uh, how will that, right. because, because there is also a clue of components in terms of planes that is being put in storage system, where you can sort of hang it anywhere. So there are these things which are there. This would be in layers. So I'm just getting a sense of, um, of if any if any one of you want to even think about it, it would be worth trying. Okay. So, Sankal, this is a challenge. Okay. Um, think about this. I mean, forget sheet metal uh, for a moment. You can do it out of any material. Uh, but your hardware needs to be one across the entire building. You can't have multiple hardwares. Now that. That is a challenge. That is something that we deal with and we would like to deal with. Like regardless, if we pro proceed with this idea on sheet metal or I don't know, whatever material that we choose with, we would like to make sure that hardware is a one or two max maximum. Reason being, we are, because we have done this day in and day out and assembled things ourselves, we know the pains of uh, assembling things. If someone has tried IKEA, they would know yeah. that reading the manual is the first task, and then second is figuring how many hardware are there, right? And then also messing up with it because you are not going to get it right in the first. Then you have to try. It becomes a day long exercise for like a family or something. So this is something. Imagine the same thing happening at a building level. It it's already a nightmare, uh, and. I don't know how China or these guys do the massive buildings and constructions uh, in, in you know, short amount of time. But uh, for us to go forward, we would want to do this with as less hardware as possible, as less components as possible, and as less. So all of this, tra this less translates to less errors. So there's no rework. There's no, nothing happening at site. So yeah, this is a this is a challenge actually. No, it's, it's beautiful because I just a couple of weeks back, I fixed uh, IKEA. So there were five, there were eight set of uh, screws and hung of different kind, let's say. And then, right. and there were folds of metal, which I had to manually did. And when I did it, everything worked except one screw. I could not fix it in the draw. Okay. I tried everything because... It doesn't have the room to do it. You need a right angle screw. I mean, it's like right angle, uh, you know. Uh, Allen key. The Allen key to sort of do it and all of those. So, so I could not manage it and still working. But the point is. Uh, it's, yeah, you're it's, not. A, <laughs> it, it's, it's in your head right now. Yeah, it's in the head. See, because every day uh, with my students, we are constantly doing this. Now, if so, for me, it's like I mean, IKEA, and then you start seeing, and then you say that you can't fix this, <laughs> and then then you start thinking about it. Uh, but but you appreciate the fact that yeah. it just comes in this small bag, and then you open up. Yeah, yeah. And you just respect the fact that yeah, uh, it, it takes time. Obviously, it takes time. Yeah. But uh, but the, what's your system is there? It's much better. Yeah, the the only thing is it will take little more volume than IKEA. Right. Okay. So, so the transportation cost is going to increase. And uh, uh, so this is one problem. One, I mean, there's the major problem with the trans. One of the major problem in India, what we are facing is that transportation damage. 
correct okay and that is some that requires um some know, innovation yeah yeah some innovation because we also manufacture furniture timber furniture and we right. and these are high ends and we realize that by the time it reaches at many place yeah, you have yeah. to just replace it and then it's very expensive because you you have used very high quality teak and yeah. even if you have insurance anything doesn't work so you have to box it yeah uh, versus so so the money relationship to volume and all of those um in that sense ikea is cracked also it is that because it has a scale uh, right yeah yeah um, nothing to take away from them on this actually uh the scale of 18% global furniture market is 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 a whole different thing yeah it's a different thing. Yeah. yeah 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 but the thing is the you don't see many product of elegant i mean you see there is a range beyond which you yeah. can go with that world view yeah there yeah. is a point after which you cannot go with that world view so right that also is important right 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 that's true Yeah, I mean, this is not really a question to uh, Gopal, but I'm just asking Mr. Sankal. Uh, given the the sort of fact that uh, contemporary product design practice permeates to a much larger level, as Gopal mentioned, it's beyond just prototyping. Uh, I wonder how we would sort of address this in in education. I mean, I am from the BDS program, and addressing and sort of. Um, very rarely talked about or not even considered a, a topic of of discussion during the design process so how how do we start thinking about these things in at a second third year level okay um, see i am not a tutor from from the design <laughs> uh, field in the in the why i am saying this is because uh, uh, in my own practice i am dealing with almost all the skills Okay, so I'm detailing. I'm also dealing at very large scale. I'm also dealing at architecture scale. So I'm touching all the skills, including urban design skills. Now, uh, uh, so there is a fundamental difference in the way I train my students in School of Architecture. Okay, and I can tell you that and why I'm doing it. Okay, uh, and so so my so so see the thing is. i only get once in their career chance to teach okay and with the numbers now i can no more uh, no more have any i mean i don't have a space now to to touch upon everyone fundamentally uh, what i am trying to do with them is that um, is is what i have repeated for them i mean because you have asked me sir let me repeat for you the the job of a tutor is to frame a problem in a way in a way that it is both exciting but at the same time it builds up students ability to think from the first principle and and build up complexity bottom up okay if let me put it let me put it that way uh, so so for architecture the fundamental uh, tool which which they can use uh, so comes from two things generally it comes from culture which means that culture i mean that your inspirations of various kinds okay and the other comes from technology now my point has been always to to build the two together but i am coming from technology especially from the structure perspective why i am constantly coming from the structure perspective is simply because the before they reach to the stage what kopal was talking about the students need to first visualize the forces they need to so if if i am seeing his his stool i in my mind i should be able to visualize how it is working okay that's the first layer which is then the second layer is the layer of where material has been applied to it the third layer is when you apply the material the tools and technology that has been used is giving shape to it with respect to ergonomics and and all of those things so i am never able to reach to the stage where kopal begins okay because for me from to train them there is the first stage then what he is trying to talk about it is the next concept which is saying too hard way not more than that and you get it but before that i have to do so many so much amount to sort of build there 
Then from there you start the next capacity because by that time your students have developed bodily knowledge or abstract knowledge to be able to visualize and articulate force, which means any object which you are seeing in your in the, in this world, in your mind it is transparent as far as forces are concerned. Okay, and you are able to make everything into mesh. All forms which is available, you are able to first visualize into mesh, and then change the geometry of the mesh to get that form. Okay, so so there are what I'm saying is that. I don't think I've been able to reach to that level. In fact, his lecture is an eye opener for me to to sort of move to the next level if it is possible. Okay, but what see his detail, what he has done, it will take maybe more than a semester to develop it. You know, because see, it requires proximity to workshop continuously. Now, in your bachelor of design program, perhaps you can do it. In architecture, I cannot do it. because i have to deal with much more layer of, so this is only a small part of it so if students want to do specialization there we can get into that so your question is valid it is not that it should not be put me i'm sure that it will be put in your later part of your education but uh, but and and you need to talk within within yourself but but as far as architecture in concern i'm just putting how i am thinking about it and where i stop and why i stop so uh sankar or uh, and uh, um abhish i just i just wanted to add to this um actually nothing really stops you um as as abhish nothing really stops you to invest your time into some material some company and some manufacturing at any given at any given point uh, in your career or in your uh, in your college right now if you in amdabad uh, back in the day when we were at nid uh, we we had uh, industrial experience courses and all of these kind of things but personally i was associated with at least three industries out there uh, and very far from what we do right now from college uh, from nid i was designing for fab india for a local guy in amdabad who was doing pipe bendings um, and you know was doing other stuff uh, so before nid also i was working at a sheet metal uh, unit at the factory so to really st- the, you can start anywhere actually you can start anywhere to um, you know this journey is long in designing products don't never take it as a short journey of that you know i did something and i arrived at something it's not it's not it's not a short journey it's not a difficult i'm not saying it's a difficult journey i'm just saying it's not a short journey so never bracket it out so right now you can join any institute any any place any manufacturing setup just to get exposure try out things over there uh, mo- people will be more than happy in amdabad uh, industrial you know circuits to experiment with any student they are always because i because i was fortunate that means i'm sure everyone is fortunate to do that uh um uh, so yeah put your hand out there and ask for help actually very simple don't wait for faculty or anything like that it yes faculty can give you exposure but the rate at which the tech is changing materials are changing out in the market um you need to also step up your game uh, in exposure internet is not going to give you any exposure like what a real machine in front of you is doing to you in fact it's it's so we went to italy to see uh, one particular sheet metal manufacturing unit in fact it was life changer for us me and himant and all of these guys in in on structures life changer in the sense because we just saw possibilities like we were like shit this is a whole different game we in fact when we get that particular machine which we are eyeing on we would change the circuit of how we we do things in internally uh, design wise so it's all so the rate, rate at which things are changing you need to put a hand out there and don't think that oh it's a long shot or no one is going to give you uh, a helping hand everyone out there is uh, you know he- happy to help most of them so i think yeah I, time is up but uh, but awesome. i think uh, it was an awesome 
presentation and uh, actually the discussion become, became even more interesting and, and he uh, sort of brought other dimensions to it which we need to sort of think about because in the absence of knowledge about technology, it becomes very difficult to sort of innovate because somebody is also trying to innovate in whatever is available as far as technology is concerned. Uh, even, in, even what when he is talking about the sheet bending, etc. But what we saw was a beautiful uh, coming together of elegance and engineering. Okay, and and, and that's what uh, we should cherish apart from uh, what we have learned today. And I'm sure that it has opened up uh, new dimensions. And from next time, we must bring at least uh, one product designer in the straight talk because they they give you a very different perspective, uh, and their scales are so intimate that uh, that you really open up to the possibilities. Uh, so thank you, uh, and thanks everyone for joining. It's the fourth session and the first lecture of the straight talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Best luck.